Ben Bernanke imposed a 2% inflation target uh, that, that started off January of 2012. So in all of the months from January of 2012 until when the pandemic rolled up on U.S. shores, 11 separate months, they hit that 2% bogey. So it was ingrained in the thinking. It doesn't matter what we do. We're like as bad as Japan. We cannot generate inflation. So the idea of letting it run hot wasn't even really a risk because they couldn't even make it run, period. If you're talking about 11 separate months in more than a decade's time, there is the inability of the Fed to generate inflation because money printing, to use the wrong terminology, I know that, but to, to use shorthand, money printing tends to kind of, it, it, it rolls around in, in, inside of itself. You don't necessarily generate the economic activity or the lending activity that you want, no matter how much QE you do. Fiscal spending, however, 43.2% of GDP in fiscal stimulus in 24 months time, which surpassed the New Deal, which was spread out over a lot longer period of time, which was 40.1% of GDP. You inject that kind of money directly into checking accounts. You're gonna generate the mother of all inflations. And I'm not sure if that's where, where, where Mohammed el is thinking, but if you give people money directly who have the greatest propensity to spend and the second and third greatest propensity to spend, because we know so many people were on the receiving end of stimulus checks, they didn't want. I can't tell you how many families I've spoken to who are like, we didn't need the child tax credit. It just, the, the $3,000 showed up every month in the account. What were we going to do? Turn it away? So, but, but that money was spent at Disneyland. That money was spent on on cars, and that money was spent on buying new homes, on repairing homes, on decks. It was spent. And I think one of the most specious arguments that we hear these days from Fed officials, it's this idea that there's this pent up savings out there. And if you look at actual dollar levels, we are back to 2019 levels of savings right now. And what savings is left in the system is in the hands of the oldest cohort and the wealthiest cohort. And that's the way it's always been. So the only byproduct you have is this massive inflation that was generated because people spent all of the money. And it generated, by the way, global inflation, not just here in the United States. You know, um, by the way, I want to mention something about global inflation, but you mentioned that people spent all that money. Would you also include Robinhood accounts in that list as well as the money where the money got spent? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm good friends with Ivy Zellman. She's done fabulous work on the decennial census. You've actually seen the percentage of adult males living with their parents increase post-pandemic. So you've got more kids in the basement, to use a cliche, than you've ever had with all of this disposable income running around and nothing to do with their time. And by the way, they don't want to work anymore, but it was a lot of fun to play GameStop and AMC and, and, and buy crypto. It was just a lot of fun. And there was, there was no backlash. You just, it was a pandemic. So yes, financial asset inflation can also be laid at the feet of fiscal, but not monetary stimulus. What the Fed did do, however, was they monetized every last penny. Completely agree. And just to buttress your point, get you to comment on this a little bit, the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, it looks at all of the developed countries in the world. They harmonize a bunch of statistics. And one of them that they harmonize is core PCE um, or core inflation, let's call it that. The U.S. has, in the developed world, the highest inflation rate. And that's rare. Usually the U.S. is somewhere in the middle. It's never one of the extremes, the highest or the lowest. Yep. Now let's transition over to the San Francisco Fed. They did a study... And so is the IMF. When you combine all of the fiscal and monetary stimulus done by all of the developed countries, the U.S. comes out as number one. So we we pump we prime the pump harder than anybody else. We've also got the highest inflation rate in the developed world. And the San Francisco Fed has put pen to paper to it, and they've estimated that all of that pump priming is probably 3% of the 8.3% inflation rate. So yes, the supply chain, five, you know, 5% five is the supply chain, the normal 2%, some other things. The extra 3% is all that pump priming. Where do you come down on that idea? Look, 
people don't want to hear it right now, but as bad as things have been in China, I keep saying you have to look at both sides of the equation. There is supply and there is demand. And when when demand was running wild in the United States, that was on top of and it compounded the supply chain disruption because there was so much demand for imports. So a bad situation was made that much worse. I would I would venture that the three percent is understated that the San Francisco Fed puts out there. So what people don't get right now is that without further stimulus, the pull on shore is not going to be what it was last year because all of this money has been spent. But but in the background, the damage has been done. You usurped the rule of law for landlords for more than 18 months. So they're in it to get they're, they're in it to recoup losses. So you know, I, I'm going off on a tangent, but, you know, Powell's press conference when he insisted that, you know, he had no control over food and no control over energy inflation and the supply disruption was certainly not his fault. Housing inflation is. And it's really, really, really sticky. And it's going to be around to haunt him for a while. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Now, let's let's talk about the, about that inflation and that sticky inflation. Bank of America and some other Wall Street firms do a lot of studies and or surveys, excuse me, uh, and they ask people their opinion about things. And right now, uh, still about a third to 40 percent of the respondents will say that inflation is transitory. And let me give you a definition of transitory. That means the Fed doesn't have to do anything. Just sit there, hold your breath, wait. The inflation rate will peak. It will go down to 2% without any intervention, either through tight fiscal policy or tightening monetary policy. Still 30, uh, third to 40%, so I'm kind of leading a witness here. Um, do you believe that that's the case when it comes to transitory inflation? Uh, do you, First of all, A, do you think that that's an accurate statistic, that there's still a large cohort of people that still believe that inflation is a non-issue and one and two, do you believe that inflation is a non-issue as we move forward from here, that it's transitory? So I think you have to distinguish between what we're seeing in terms of recessionary impulses right now that's going to act as a governor on prices. You have to look at that separately from the inflation that's sitting there, that's going to be there for a long time. So you can say that a recession, because that's effectively, to me, team transitory right now is saying the recession is going to fix inflation. Well, okay, great. But now you're going to have a recession. So they have a point to the extent that that the, the, the lack of demand is going to pull down prices for very discretionary purchases by force that's not gonna take care of the pre-existing condition of the patient that was not treated when it should have been treated last year, when the Fed was doing nothing, when they needed to be doing something preemptively. And that's exactly what Milton Friedman taught us is that central bankers are responsible for not getting inflation under control preemptively. And it's exactly what happened with LBJ and my hero after Paul Volcker, William McChesney Martin, he blinked. He blinked for a nanosecond during the Vietnam War because LBJ put so much pressure on him. So he wasn't preemptive with inflation. And because he didn't nip it in the bud early on, and then he was succeeded by Burns and Miller, and that just made a really bad situation that much worse, Paul Volcker stepped into what he stepped into. But the original sin was McChesney Martin not getting in front of inflation. And that's what the Fed has not done. So you can't feel that good about saying it's eventually going to be transitory if you're left with stagflation. Completely agree. And that gets me to the Fed now. Um, mm. Powell seemed to contradict himself within 10 minutes last week at the FOMC meeting. The opening paragraph was, I want to take the moment to speak to the American public directly. Inflation is a problem. I understand it. We have the tools and the resolve to, to deal with this inflation problem. 10 minutes later, he said 75 basis points is off the table. Do you believe they have A, the tools, and B, the resolve? Because 
You pointed out with McChesney Martin and some of the others, Arthur Burns, you didn't bring up, but we could throw him in there too. Time and again, the Fed blinks when it comes to dealing with inflation. But Powell told the American public last week, he has the resolve and he has the tools, do they? Right now, because there are so many exogenous forces on inflation, and I mean, food's hot. Right now, because there's so many outside forces they only have so much, so many tools to address inflation. If they want to address housing inflation, which is the largest line item on any given households in any given household's budget, they can break the house the back of housing, which brings us back to resolve. And it wasn't the seventy five basis points that got me as much as when he started falling back into his old pattern of repeating if financial conditions warrant if financial conditions warrant. And that's like code for as long as the stock market hangs in there, then we'll have all kinds of resolution. If it and and that was what was that was what was initially interpreted with the three three and a half percent move that was however many standard deviations away from the norm. The backlash the next day was this is no Paul Volcker. This is not somebody who has the resolve to do what needs to be done to eventually get, look runaway prices that the Fed can control, i.e. housing. That is not in the public interest, which is in the Federal Reserve's very top paragraph of their main website. Their, as his first paragraph of the statement said, that he was going to make the hard moves on behalf of the American people because it is, it is, the Fed is mandated to make, make policy in the public interest. He, he apparently is, because, but, but and with housing costs eating people alive, you've got to break it or then you just stick it to the people. I completely agree. Um, when you talk about uh, tools in resolve, an interesting dynamic has been happening in the last you know month or so with the Fed officials. And I'll credit um, Steve Matthews and Simon Kennedy of Bloomberg uh, that have pointed this out. The criticism that the Fed is getting from former Fed officials is probably the most we've seen in 40 years. You got Rich Clarida saying, well, they got to go to three and a half percent. You've got Roger Ferguson, a former Fed, another vice chairman saying a recession looks inevitable. You've got Bill Dudley. He's been the most interesting of all of them. The mm. former New York Federal Reserve president, he wrote an eye opening op ed last month saying that if the stock market doesn't go down, the Fed has to lower it. And to me, the, the biggest one was last week, as we record this, there was a monetary policy conference the Hoover Institute had at Stanford University. And on this stage, they had Jim Bullard and they had Randy Quarles, the former vice chairman for supervision. Yep. And Mickey Levy asked the question, would the Fed tolerate the inflation rate or the unemployment rate going from three and a half to five if it meant breaking the back of inflation. And Jim Bullard said, I'll let Randy take that question. And then Quarles said the answer was yes. Why can't they just say what they want? Why do we have to drag out all the retired Fed officials to say the quiet parts out loud? Why couldn't Jim Bullard just say it? Why did he have to turn and say, you're out, but you're somewhat in, Randy. Why don't you say the thing I can't say? Jim, I think I think internally right now, especially the Federal Reserve Board and especially the Federal Open Market Committee that meets in Washington, D.C., I think that policy right now is paralyzed. I think that, and, and that's what else Quarles said that was so eye-opening, was that the leadership battle within the Fed actually caused the Fed to delay and postpone hiking when they knew they should have been when Brainerd and Powell were effectively duking it out inside. So I, I think that I, I think that Quarles and others are saying that the Fed needs to have Volcker's resolve to put the US economy into recession forcibly in order to get the types of inflation that are ravaging US households under control. My concern is that because it's Quarles saying it, and this is somebody who the media has not done a very good job of of being explicit in that he could have stayed on the Federal Reserve Board through 2032 and basically quit in protest. 
if it takes people who are on the outside to say what needs to be done on the inside, my concern is that what needs to be done won't get done. And that you're gonna have the market begin to price in Fed easing. And as you have, have, have done such a good job of communicating over the years, the risk of the Fed being reactionary in how it behaves, as opposed to diligent, disciplined, and proactive, come what may, because they've got a goal of beating down inflation. It's a really complicated world out there. We've got massive inflation, recession fears, war in Europe, COVID, China issues. What the hell's happening? Everyone's got an opinion, but who's right, who's wrong? As co-founder of Real Vision, I've got my own view, but maybe I'm wrong too. And I want to go and find out more from real experts, real in-depth analysis. And I've hand-chosen my experts for this two-week journey of discovery in global recession. Is everyone wrong? I've chosen people like Peter Zihan to talk to him about geopolitics, David Rosenberg about the economy, and Pierre Andran, the world's most famous energy trader, about how to navigate the oil markets and where it's all going. This starts on May the 2nd, and I'm going to learn so much about what really is going on and how to best navigate it. Yes, not everybody's going to be saying the same thing, but it's going to allow me to piece together an investment framework to navigate these complicated times. Now, normally we'd give you a seven-day trial for one dollar, but because this is so important for all of you, and I think it's one of the most important pieces of content we've ever done, we're extending that free trial for two weeks for one dollar. So you get the entire campaign of all of these great minds. And it's only one dollar for all of this. So just go to realvision.com forward slash global recession to find out more and join me as I try and figure out what the hell's going on.